If you've ever had to peruse the awfully long menu at an Indian restaurant, there's always one dish that stands out. A dish that us desis are known for around the world. I'm talking about the tandoor, a clay oven used to make everything from tandoori naan to tandoori chicken or even tandoori paneer for all you vegetarians out there. The tandoor is an integral part of any brown kid's childhood. But what if this cylindrical clay urn was used for more than just cooking up some of India's most popular and well-known cuisines? What if it was used for something more sinister, something that haunted the residents of Delhi for years to come? This is the story of that clay oven. This is the story of the tandoor murder. Hey everyone, I'm Aryan and I'm Ashwara and together we are the Desi Crime Podcast. This is where we tell stories of true crime that differ from the mainstream. Untold stories of Desi killers, Desi cases and Desi crime. Aryan, the case that you have for us today is one that I think we all know happened. We just don't know the details of this case. It's kind of an older case for a generation of people as old as us. Right, even I've heard whispers of this case growing up, but this case happened way before I was born. Right. And it all begins in India's capital, Delhi. Although Delhi is often portrayed as a bustling city with its bazaars, bumper to bumper traffic and endless seas of people, Sunday nights are really quiet in the city, especially during blistering hot summers. And on Sunday, July 2nd, 1995, it was no different. It was around 11 p.m. when under the dark skies of Delhi, when pollution hadn't yet swept the country's capital and the stars were still visible, Delhi Police Constable Kunju and Home Guard Chandrapal from the Kinnaut Place Police Station were about to set off to patrol the Janpath area of the city. The two most likely didn't expect to come across much that night. Probably more of the same: a drunk causing a ruckus, a few burglaries, and maybe the odd carjacking or two. Barely half an hour after leaving the police station, the duo spotted something out of the ordinary. Near the Ashok Yatri Nivas Hotel, large flames pierced into the starry sky. They ran to Ashoka Road to see where the fire was coming from. They saw flames shooting up from the hotel, not the main building, but the restaurant inside, the Bagia Barbecue Restaurant. When Constable Kunju approached the restaurant and peered into the entrance, he could clearly see the source of the fire. It was coming from somewhere inside the kitchen. The hotel security guard told the officers they had nothing to worry about. According to him, the restaurant was just burning some waste paper and cardboard inside. The officers didn't protest and went back to their 6-hour long patrol. But while they patrolled the nearby area, they heard screeches in the distance. Hotel mein aag lag gayi. Hotel mein aag lag gayi. There's a fire in the hotel. There's a fire in the hotel. A vegetable vendor saw the officers and ran towards them, warning that a fire had engulfed the hotel. When the officers turned around, the flames had grown, reaching 35 feet into the sky. Smoke filled the air. It was no longer a calm, starry night in Delhi. The police went past the hotel gates and up to the entrance of the restaurant, where they met a man in a long white shirt known as a kurta. His name was Keshav Kumar, the manager of the restaurant. Keshav wasn't alarmed by the flames coming from the restaurant. Just burning some old posters, he said. But Constable Kunju wasn't buying it. He ran to the nearest police outpost and telephoned all the emergency units. Constable Kunju shouldn't have bought it. I just want to point out to everyone how weird it is yeah. to have a fire running like that in July in Delhi when the city is hot, the city is humid, it's the monsoon months, everything sticky and disgusting. It's very unusual to have people light bonfire and have a fire running just for themselves like that. Which is that. otherwise a pretty common scene very in Delhi, common, right? Yeah. During the winters, security guards yep. and people all over peasants, they usually have a small bonfire going on heating right. themselves up, but yeah. in July it is so unheard of unheard of and in general fires were no small joke in delhi in the 1990s the infamous siddharth continental hotel fire of 1986 was etched in delhi's memory when 37 people lost their lives kunju didn't want a replica of that incident under his watch but by the time he returned from the outpost the fire had only gotten worse The cop duo demanded entry into the restaurant to see what was going on, but the men at the entrance barred them from going inside. 
That didn't stop Constable Kunju, who was certain that the fire posed a threat to the entire hotel building. The officers found an alternate route into the restaurant, this time by climbing a seven-foot-high fence and entering the back. A few men stood inside the kitchen, but two men stuck out to the officers. The restaurant manager Keshav Kumar, who had denied the officers' entry into the restaurant when they first saw the flames, and a man draped in a white kurta with a rounded belly named Sushil Sharma, the owner of the Bagia Barbecue. The officers had a strange sight in front of them. The fire was coming from a tandoor, an integral part of any Indian barbecue restaurant. Around the tandoor, the men had stacked wood and other materials, and it was obvious the fire wasn't meant to grill naan or chicken. The men were burning waste, but nonetheless, the fire had to go out. Kunju confronted Keshav and Sushil and told them that the fire had the potential to burn down the entire hotel. Sushil said he was a Congress party worker and was simply burning old campaign posters. Sushil wanted to let Kunju, a lowly constable, know who he was dealing with. But Kunju didn't let Sushil's party affiliation stop him. The officers started to fill up buckets with water to douse the fire. By this time, other officers joined the scene, Sub-Inspector Rajesh Kumar, PCR Head Constable Majid Khan and Constable Rajbir Singh. With the other officers' help, the fire was extinguished in minutes. But the flames had already done their fair share of damage. The officers took Keshav, who they believed caused the fire, and went up to the first floor terrace of the adjacent Ashok Yatri Nivas Hotel to assess the damage from a higher vantage point. As the police looked around for signs of fire damage, Kunju felt a gust of heat float up again from Bagia Barbecue's kitchen, followed by a wretched smell of smoke. When the officers looked over the terrace into the restaurant, to their astonishment, the tandoor was ablaze again, and self-proclaimed Congress party worker Sushil Sharma was fanning the flames. Kunju ran to the edge of the terrace, jumped to the bottom into the back of the restaurant, and forced his way into the kitchen. By the time he got there, Sushil had disappeared. But this time around, the smoke coming from the fire had a different scent. It didn't smell like burning plastic or cardboard like before. Kunju smelled burning flesh. But Kunju couldn't do anything. He needed to stop the fire. Like before, he doused the tandoor with buckets of water and was able to douse the majority of the fire with just a few smaller flames lingering in the clay pot. Kunju peered into the tandoor to see what was inside. But what Kunju found wasn't paper, it wasn't cardboard, it wasn't a bunch of old campaign posters. Crouched inside the tandoor was a charred human body. The wooden log stacked around the tandoor perversely resembled a Hindu fire, the traditional cremation ceremony conducted by Hindus. The police were unsure of exactly what was happening, but they knew this was far from a traditional ritual. However, there was one thing they knew for sure. The Bagia restaurant had been turned into a mortuary. A blackened, burnt body with just a patch of black hair remained in the tandoor. The crime scene bustled with police officers. Luckily, the restaurant's manager, Keshav Kumar, was still on the scene, so officers scooped him up and began questioning him. Keshav evaded all the officers' questions, except one. When the police asked him what his relationship to Sushil, the owner of the restaurant, was, all he murmured was, Unke mujh par kafi ehsaan hai. I am highly indebted to him. But who was Sushil Sharma? What was he doing starting a fire at the restaurant at 11pm? And was he even aware that there was a body in the tandoor? To answer all those questions and more, we'll have to rewind the clock, as we often do, back to April 13th, 1966, when Harbhajan Singh and Jaswant Kaur gave birth to their darling daughter, Naina. Naina was an absolute superstar. She graduated from Shyama Prasad Mukherjee College of Delhi University in 1986 with top-notch grades. Later, she joined the Delhi Flying Club to get her student pilot's license and then got her private pilot's license in the United Kingdom. Nana was also deeply involved in college politics and was an active member of the NSUI or the National Students' Union of India, the student wing of the Indian National Congress, colloquially known as the Congress Party. And that was where she met another young and ambitious NSUI worker, Sushil Sharma. In 1986, Sushil became the president of the NSUI and nominated Nana to the post of the State General Secretary. 
Sushil and Nana were ambitious and professional, both looking to make headways into their political careers. There was nothing romantic between the two. Or at least it remained that way for a while. Nana was in love with someone else. His name was Masloop Karim, but he, a Muslim, and Nana, a Sikh, weren't compatible in society's eyes. Nevertheless, Matloob and Nana continue to nurture their relationship and even live together for a time. It's unclear what or when it happened, but the relationship eventually fizzled out and Matloob married a woman from his community named Naz Gul. When Matloob committed himself to another woman, Nana decided to move out in December 1988. But she and Matloob vowed to remain friends. The relationship didn't end on a sour note. Now, whether or not Matloob and Nana just remained friends is up for speculation. But not soon after leaving, Nana was in love again. This time with someone she worked very closely with. Someone who shared the same interests, career and ambitions as hers. The president of the NSUI, Sushil Sharma. But Nana's relationship with Sushil was a tumultuous one. As a family described it, Nana had to stop at the second rung of the ladder of her political career because she fell in love with Sushil Sharma. His precondition to marriage was that Nana should stop all her political activities and forget about her political aspirations. She agreed. Once an ambitious pilot and aspiring politician, Nana was now caged and stuck inside, in apartment 8-2A Diz Sector 2, Mandir Marg. Not many years after leaving Matloob, in May 1992, Sushil and Nana got married at the Birla Mandir in the presence of only Nana's family. Sushil's family wasn't present. The marriage from the get-go was kept on the hush-hush. In reality, the marriage was unofficial, since no official documents were ever submitted to the state about the couple's union. But if there was love near the beginning of the relationship, it had most certainly dissipated. The once free-spirited Nana was now a caged bird, confined to the boundaries of a small Delhi apartment. Sushil had denied Nana from doing anything in politics, so she was limited to working at her own small boutique. But although the boutique became a successful business, it wasn't what she wanted to do. Sushil was also abusive towards Nana. Sushil, who was often drunk, beat Nana in the evenings when he returned from work. He didn't let other men come near her, nor did he allow her to talk to other men. The breaking point came when Nana discovered Sushil's affair with Illa Junjunwala, a woman living in South Delhi. Sushil and Illa had a long-term relationship prior to his marriage with Nana, so after discovering the affair, Nana contacted Illa, who unsparingly revealed Sushil's womanizing ways and multiple affairs. Nana had had enough. But she didn't want to end things, the very opposite in fact. She wanted her and Sushil's relationship to be public. Nana was in pain, physically and emotionally. So she wrote in her diary, Sushil, I know you hate me. You cannot accept me. So do not waste your time. Take care of yourself and forgive me. Leave me to my fate. We cannot continue like this because I cannot win your confidence even by killing myself. Take away whatever you have to. Don't misunderstand me. Do not let your life be spoiled. I know I do not deserve you. Leave me and make the best from your life. But do not say anything to my family. They are innocent. If you want, you can punish me. The last sentence in retrospect is haunting. For Sushil did punish her. In these tough times, Nana sought out her past lover and now friend, Matloob, for help. Sushil always suspected there was something between the pair and hated Matloob. Now, Ashwarya, what are your thoughts on Nana speaking to her ex-boyfriend about her now husband? I think exclusively having a conversation with someone you've dated in the past is not a big deal to me, but the contents matter. So I can see why having a conversation about your current partner with your ex can seem hurtful. Right. There is nothing intrinsically wrong about the act of speaking to your ex-partner, right. but I can see how it makes Sushil jealous depending on the contents of what they're talking about. Yeah, exactly. But none of this takes away from the fact that the context here is she is being domestically abused by Sushil and she has to vent out to somebody and that might as well be her ex-partner. But whether or not it's understandable to me or you, it 
clearly wasn't understandable to Sushil, whose raging insecurity, alcoholism and domestic abuse reached its peak three years into their marriage. It was July 2nd, 1995, and Delhi was hot and humid because of an incoming monsoon. It was around evening when Nana poured herself her favourite drink, a Bloody Mary. As she lay in the cool bedroom, sipping on her cocktail, she imagined the beautiful future that awaited her. Away from her abusive husband and away from India, Nana had planned to retreat to Australia, where she had successfully enlisted to work. She called up her friend, Matloob, to ask whether he had an update on her visa, which he was supposed to pick up from a travel agent. Matloob said he hadn't picked up the visa yet, but would go in the next couple of days. At around 8.15 p.m., Sushil pulled up into their apartment building's parking lot. Nana blandly greeted him and offered him a drink. The pair sipped on the drinks without speaking. But as alcohol coursed through Sushil's bloodstream, insecurities rushed to the surface. He began doubting Nana, and as was routine, redialed the last phone number on the telephone when she wasn't looking. From the other side of the receiver came a man's deep voice. Hello. It was someone Sushil knew all too well. It was Matloob, Nana's ex-partner. That was all the evidence Sushil needed. He hung up the phone, stormed into the bedroom, and a screaming match ensued. What happened next is best described by Officer Maxwell Pereira, one of the lead investigators on this case. Quietly, he goes to the chest of drawers, opens one, takes out his revolver and inspects it, then loads it with four cartridges. In cold blood, without a second thought, he turns around and aims at Nana's head, firing three times at point-blank range. Two of the bullets find their mark in Nana's head and neck. The third bullet misses and hits the plywood by the air conditioner. Nana falls, bleeding profusely. She writhes in pain on the bed for a moment and is still. She dies almost instantaneously. Ravi Nanasani was shot in cold blood that night, but the demon in Sushil eventually faded and he gathered his wits about him. He didn't have time to mourn and lament his actions. He drank cool water to calm his nerves. The all-important question prodded at him, what he would do with her body. The most obvious answer for any amateur murderer was to throw her into a river or a lake. But that's tougher than it sounds. Nevertheless, he decided to dispose her body in the nearby Yamuna River. But Sushil didn't know what he was doing. He grabbed the bed sheet and wrapped Nana's body in it, and then wrapped it further with a plastic sheet used for dining tables. He tried to wipe Nana's blood off his clothes and the floor, but there was simply too much. He dragged the body all the way downstairs to the parking lot where his Maruti car was. He opened the trunk, stuffed the corpse awkwardly inside, only to realize his white kurta pajama was drenched in blood. He ran back up to the apartment to change clothes before running back down to his car and driving off towards the Yamuna at around 9.30 p.m. By the time Sushil reached the ITO bridge that spanned across the Yamuna River, he realized just how impractical the plan was. Not only was the bridge near the Delhi police headquarters, there was just too much traffic flowing past. This was Delhi at 9 p.m. Of course there was traffic. He shifted gears and hatched a new plan. He made a U-turn and made his way towards Ashoka Road. At 10.15 p.m., Sushil reached the Bagia Barbecue, the restaurant that he owned. Inside was Keshav, the manager of the restaurant. Sushil confessed to Keshav what he had done and begged him for help. Keshav was disgusted and appalled by the murder, but nonetheless decided to help Sushil dispose of the body. Sushil had helped Keshav through some of his toughest times, and Keshav felt indebted to the restaurant owner. All the guests who were eating were told to hurry and finish before being kicked out. Keshav gave all the restaurant staff rupees 25 in lieu of the free meal they all got at the end of their shift. The restaurant had just a few people remaining, Besides Sushil and Keshav, there was a security guard outside who had no idea what was happening inside the kitchen. A makeshift pyre made of wooden logs and paper was erected around the tandoor. Nana's lifeless body wrapped inside the plastic bag was placed over the tandoor and more wood was piled on top. Before they set Nana's corpse ablaze, they looked around for ghee or clarified butter used in traditional Indian cuisine. 
somehow the barbecue restaurant didn't have any ghee so sushil sent keshav to go and buy more nearby the pair used four slabs of amul butter to burn nana's body because of this case people in the surrounding neighborhood stopped eating tandoori food for a couple of years and tandoori restaurants across delhi felt the brunt of it The tandoor was supposed to be this beautiful component of a traditional Indian kitchen and has a rich cultural value. Its roots originate in Rajasthan where archaeologists have found tandoor remains dating from 2600 BC, about the same time as the pyramids. But on July 2nd, 1995, the tandoor was defiled. While burning his wife's body, Sushil kept repeating, "Ye maine kya kar diya? Ye mujhse kya ho gaya? What have I done?" How could I have done this? It was perhaps a tad too late to regret his decision, and his attempts to cover up the murder ended up being completely futile when around 11 p.m. Constable Kunju was patrolling the streets. The investigation unfolded at a rapid pace once Nana's body was identified by her parents. So Sheil was being hunted and he was on the run trying to use his political connections to help him move from city to city. It was in Bangalore when Sushil was taken into police custody. Pleading innocent, he had no chance of getting off easy. The investigation was fairly simple. From witness testimony to DNA evidence, too much was stacked against him and his lawyers. On November 7th, 2003, Sushil was sentenced to death by the trial court. His death sentence was affirmed by the High Court on February 19th, 2007, declaring that his crime was an act of extreme depravity that shook the conscience of the society. However, his sentence was later reduced to life in prison. And you know what, Ashwarya, on December 21st, 2018, Sushil was actually released from jail for serving his life sentence. And this is what that. the bench had to say. Incarceration of convicted prisoners such as Sharma serving life term does not result in suspension of his fundamental right and he is not denuded of the rights enshrined in every person within the meaning of article 21 of the constitution of India and those are the rules in India like life in prison doesn't literally mean you have to be in prison till you die right. the statute of limitations is 20 years in India and so your case has to go for review within that time period and while i understand why the constitution of india is drafted the way it is i'm sure there's a specific reason for mm-hmm. it at the end of the day it just sucks that a man like that is out and about and free so shiel had been in prison for 23 years and as heinous as his crime was he came to accept his mistake according to him he regretted every moment of the murder in prison he actually became a devout hindu seeking solace and forgiveness in religion now forgiving him is not up to me but when he left jail this is what he had to say for himself I am the only son. The last few years inside prison were the most difficult ones for me. My parents had to be hospitalized and were keeping unwell. There was no one to take care of them. I do not know what I will do apart from being there for my parents. I'm starting a new life today. I have to first perform my duty as a son. I've spent over 20 years in prison. If I can be of any help to Tehar, I would be happy to help the jail administration. I have no complaints against anyone. all the negativity in my life that one second which cost me 23 years has been washed away by the sweat inside prison whether or not you believe sushil deserves a second chance at life nana will never get that chance this story is about more than just a defiled culturally significant cooking pot it's about how a split second decision can lead to a lifetime of regret